And welcome to this edition of The Cold Front. I'm Sean Bailey. And I'm Matthew Schaefer. And we talk about weather events that happen. We usually think about Tornado Alley in the United States or the blizzards we take, but we don't always stop to think about what happens in other places of the world. This globe is, has a lot of diverse land masses and that can cause air to move in different ways and really yeah. can cause a lot of interesting events around the world. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by talking about something in the season that we're familiar with right now. Well, actually not so much. Um, we're gonna start with winter, although we haven't had much of it this year. Um, and we're gonna start with the North Pole. And very specifically a place that's even much colder than what we're used to. Now the Arctic Circle is obviously cold. It doesn't see daylight for quite some time during the year because that's kind of the definition of the Arctic Circle. Right. But uh, a little bit south in some parts of Siberia in Russia is in the Arctic Circle, some parts aren't. And now Siberia takes up 77% of Russia, so it's, wow. a, very, it's a very large uh, land mass. And in, most of the people live on the eastern side, obviously not in Siber yeah, Siberia. Yeah, the, the, the very cold part of Siberia is not very populated for a very good reason. <laughs> it, it, Siberia has the record coldest temperature in the northern hemisphere. That was minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit recorded in 1922 up in wow. Siberia. That is very cold and it's very understanding why people don't live up there. Right, What? what would the, was there any wind associated with that? Because I, I imagine that if you even get like a five mile an hour wind, you have a wind chill of like <laughs> negative 50 degrees or something. Well, it's already minus 90, <laughs> so the wind chill would be, what, minus 110 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. At that point, it's just so cold, it doesn't even matter, really. But uh, you compare Siberia, how cold it is, and it's a little odd that it's colder than the t North Pole, the exact top of the globe. Yeah. And the kind of reason for that is, is it's just its position on the globe. It's in the continent of Asia, which is the largest landmass on the Earth, and it's on the very far eastern side. So there's very no ocean influence, and as the weather, weather generally comes from the west to the east, but you would think, you know, it's pretty close to the ocean on the Pacific side. Well, there are mountains <laughs> there, and any air coming up over the mountains, it's much colder when it comes even down on the other side. Right, and you also have mountains on the other side, the Ural Mountains that separate basically Europe and Asia. So it's kind of locked in this plateau of um, elevation, and that really contributes to a lot of just cold air just sitting over Siberia for very long periods of time. And very dry air as well, the air coming down the mountains it has virtually no moisture, so it's not the blizzard-type ridden area that you would think of how cold it is, and even at those record temperatures, you really couldn't support any precipitation as well. And we talk about how cold Siberia is and in the northern hemisphere, but that's only the northern hemisphere record, that minus 90. On the southern half of the planet, Antarctica gets much colder. Yeah, and also in addition to cold, I mean, we also think of it as a very snowy place where all the penguins play and surf down icebergs. Polar bears and stuff. Yeah, well, polar bears are in the northern hemisphere. Penguins are all in the southern hemisphere. So Easily confused, a lot of people think that. Yes, polar bears are only on the north side. Seals go both ways, though. Um, but for the most part, um, Antarctica is a desert. There's no real precipitation going on especially in the interior part of Antarctica where we associate these blizzard conditions. It's all just blowing snow that's already fallen from a long time ago. And it's just, I mean, stay there because it's not gonna along, melt. That goes along with what we consider the definition of a desert to be. We think desert, oh, hot, uh, you know, Sahara, uh, sandy. Well, desert's not necessarily defined by precip as much, or by temperature. temperature, it's defined by precip, you yeah. know, and just how little what rain and snow and precipitation it gets. Yeah, I mean, it gets less than eight inches of snow around the South Pole region every year, which is very minimal considering we get about 39 and a half inches here in Chicago on an average winter, which, I mean, this winter's been below average, but um, for the most part, we have uh, significantly more snowfall than Antarctica does. And speaking of cold, Matt said that it was uh, 96? Minus 90, 90 Fahrenheit in Siberia. While in Antarctica, it's minus 129 degrees, recorded at a Russian station out in, um, just east of the North Pole, or South Pole. And that area is actually cold, the east end of Antarctica is actually cooler than the western half. And that's due to 
the elevation difference. Obviously, when you go up in the atmosphere, you cool down and temperature decreases as you go up in the atmosphere. And since Antarctica, which also has a lot of mountain ranges, um, is more elevated in the eastern half, it's cooler than the western half. Yeah, so I mean, there's just oh, there's a lot of stuff going on in Antarctica. It's not all just this barren thing. It's got its temperature differences, but obviously not uh, like we think of temperature differences. It's much more to the extremes and cold, colder, and coldest. Yeah. But it's got its elevation changes, and that allows it to have different types of very cold climates. Yeah, and for the most part, it's very consistent throughout um, its elevation. I mean, the eastern half and not western half obviously have different elevations, but it's all mountainous there. Um, the ice can be one to two miles thick in some regions on average, um, even more than that. So, because to be, or for the most part, Antarctica is about 98% covered by ice. So, there's a lot of ice there as well, and with not getting too much in the way of any moisture, it's been moisture that's fallen over long periods of time. So that's why a lot of people are actually interested in Antarctica as a resource. And it's one of the largest sources of fresh water we have on the planet, um, that in Greenland. So um, in the well, future, it might be a resource that we need to use. And getting down there and adapting to these very cold temperatures and different climates is going to be necessary. Well, I want to step back of what saying. We mentioned uh, the blowing snow and blizzard conditions and how it's all snow that had fallen. And mm -hmm. the reason why it continues to blow around for so long is just because of how dry it is. Mm -hmm. It's just this pellet type snow. You know, it's, it's not this heavy wet snuff we see in lake effect or in the big snows. It's just really dry pellety stuff. And it just kind of sits on the surface and just blows around from one spot. Then the wind changes and it blows back. And that's where you get the blizzard conditions. And I don't want to digress too far, but a blizzard literally is just the blowing snow. There doesn't have to be anything right. falling from the sky to have a blizzard warning or a blizzard. Yeah, and with the blizzard, for the most part, um, when we have a certain temperature, when we're too cold for snow, we stop growing those snowflakes, those dendrites we call them in meteorology. And when they stop growing, obviously we're not going to get too much in the way of any more snow formation. So with Antarctica being so far below average, or so far um, in the negatives in terms of temperature, um, it, can, it can cause some problems even for snow formation with it being so cold. Also, when you get along the coast, um, it tends to get a little bit warmer. And you actually get more wind along the coast because there's actually a contrast between the relatively warm southern ocean and the frigid landmass that is Antarctica. So you do get a bit of a pressure gradient developing over there. Not so much in the way of any fronts developing, though, over Antarctica, or at least in the interior part. So not too much in the way of any changing weather, at least over the South Pole. But the penguins do get some frequent weather changes. Well, I guess when we come back, uh, we're, you talked about the land sea breeze type thing in Antarctica. Well, there's a much bigger land sea breeze type thing that develops up in India and other parts of the world. That's called the monsoon. We'll talk about that after the break. Hi everybody, I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN, and I'm on VUTV. It's awesome, baby, with a capital A. up on sex don't give up on birth control either there are more methods than you think find yours at bedsider.org up on sex don't give up on birth control either there are more methods than you think find yours at bedsider.org it's time to join forces get energized and fuel up right because starting today every kid in america 
has a mission. Bring out the action hero in you. Be part of the greatest action movie ever. The first movie that puts you in the action. Show us how you train and eat like an action hero. Join in at actionheroalliance.com. is an adventure waiting to come to life. Visit new worlds. Encounter new friends. And discover the power of reading. Go to read.gov to read A Princess of Mars, the first novel to feature John Carter. A new world awaits. Read. Hi everybody, I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN, and I'm on VU TV. It's awesome, baby, with a capital A. <laughs> and welcome back to this edition of the Cold Front. We're talking about global weather events, and before the break, we were talking about Antarctica and how it's so cold. Well, also, it's not something you typically associate with getting a sunburn. With all that solar radiation, it's a big problem. You're definitely going to need your sunscreen. But where we're going next is actually somewhere where you'll think to need your sunscreen as well. We're going to be talking about monsoons. And most people just associate them with, with rain, um, areas where you have perpetual instances of rain every day for so long, kind of like Seattle, except less dreary. Um, but for the most part, monsoons are just a reversal in the wind shift. When you get really warm temperatures in the summer, especially over places like India and Bangladesh, you start to develop what's called a low pressure system. And that area, of, um, that area brings together air. And since air can't go down into the ground, it goes up. And what you need for a typical rainstorm is just air going up and moisture. And with the um, winds bringing in that moisture and the low pressure developing over India, that translates to monsoon and a lot of umbrellas. Absolutely, and rain, obviously the main thing with monsoon, and it's just so available, everything is just right down in the tropics for that to happen. It's the, the temperatures are warm enough that the air can hold so much moisture, right. so that, that low pressure that develops causes the rising motion and brings all that air, which happens to be coming off the water, which is very humid just because it's water. And yeah. That water evaporates into the air where, over the real hot land, rises up, and it's going to rain for a long time, and it does. And people depend on that. Um, farmers rely on that so much in terms of when they're going to plant their crops. And forecasting that is a huge thing, much like forecasting severe weather and snowstorms is here. Forecasting that monsoon is a big deal, and they really rely on meteorologists to step up their game and forecast that accurately. And there's so much in that, just as if that, that monsoon is delayed from two days from average or a day that little time period, that's, they, they, there's so much rain that falls that can that one day or two days can affect it so greatly that the first couple of days can determine how the crops turn out. So it's it's life and death in India right. and other places where the monsoon comes. They rely on it, and just a short time period can have such a great impact. It's really amazing. Yeah, because their main crop right down there is rice and. That relies on a lot of water and standing water at that. So definitely these monsoons are very, very, very important. And it's not just in India that we have these monsoons. Actually, there is a North American monsoon over, the, over Arizona, which happens. And that's where they get pretty much their yearly rainfall for the year. Um, but the other one we're going to talk about, since we're in the global sector, is actually Africa. There's a line going across the equator, or ba that basically follows the equator, going up and down, it's called the intertropical convergence zone. And like I said before, when you have low pressure, you have the rising motion, and then if you have some moisture, you have a rainstorm. Well, this intertropical convergence zone, or ITCZ, will actually move up and down West Africa, um, as, as it does also in the rainforests of Brazil and um, Indonesia as well. But the West African monsoon will 
move up and down um, and water the place called the Sahel, or the area south of the Sahara Desert, which obviously we associate Sahara with very dry air, but there's areas where you farm just south of that. And yeah, it's the main grassland area. And it's just amazing. Like, it moves up and down, and that's caused to just the tilt of the earth. It's a seasonal mm -hmm. shift. It tries to right. stay in the area where there's the most amount of sunlight and radiation. So in summer, it's further north, and in winter, it drops to the south side of the equator. And that seasonal shift, and again, very similar to what happens in India, that if it, it's a couple days late, mm -hmm. there's the rain supply uh, changing, and it's a big deal. Yeah, and it's become more and more of an issue lately because of desertification. Um, people are taking over and um, using this land in the Sahel for farming, but they're not doing it properly, so um, the Sahara is actually expanding its um, reign of dryness and unfortunately it's looking like the monsoon is having less and less of an impact on the Sahel because of desertification and there's just not as much room for moisture to get in. And so. as we look back towards India a little bit, there's even more to it than just the winds coming off the, the sea and the low setting up. The Himalayan mountain range Mm -hmm. It's just a big factor, too, because that mo as that moisture tries to go further inland, it goes up the side of the mountain until the point where it reaches where it becomes a cloud, and it'll rain there. So all that moisture is dumped in the Indian region, and that, we see that in all over the place. Where I mean, It's just amazing how much the land affects the weather, and that's really this whole show is just how it's set up near everything, what source of water is around it. And yeah. And the Indian population relies on the Ganges and the um, Euphrates. Euphrates is Iraq. Ah. Um, there's oh, the, yeah. the Tigris, I believe. Tigris that river. Um, they rely on that as their main source of water irrigation. They even and that comes consider down from it sacred. The mountains and that comes that source of water coming in. It's all yeah. interconnected. So it's it's very interesting looking at that. Also, um, with regards to the monsoon, the Somali mountains along the eastern edge of Africa. Also, um, uh, we learned about this in Tropical, where you have a high pressure system building off the coast of Madagascar, which kind of feeds into the, uh, feeds this low level moisture, but it bounces off the mountains and hits straight for Pakistan and India. So there's, there's a lot of geographic features and meteorological factors that intertwine to make this thing happen. And, like I said, there's more monsoons elsewhere throughout the world, um, but for the most part, these are the main ones that we, we were discussing. And after the break, we're gonna move out of tropical weather, but we're still gonna- Hi everybody, I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN, and I'm on VUTV. It's awesome, baby, with a capital A. <laughs>
Beyond with the on sex, don't give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Find yours at bedsider.org. Hi everybody, I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN and I'm on VUTV. It's awesome baby with a capital A. <laughs> and welcome back to the cold front. Now 90% of tornadoes happen right here in the United States near Tornado Alley. However, it's not the only place in the world that happens. There's Kind of a tornado alley in itself in India, where we talk about the monsoons happening, but they, they can get to some, some severe weather as well. Yeah, um, especially with the result of the Himalayas and the mountains um, in Iran, they actually contribute to a lot of that upward motion, and they can produce severe storms, severe storms rather, strong enough to produce tornadoes. Um, really, like, like how we have it set up here with the Rocky Mountains being so, um, perpendicular or north-south oriented to the general west to east flow of weather, Iran or Ir the mountains of Iran aren't necessarily as perpendicular, but they do have that, that lifting mechanism. And for the most part, they will have, um, the India and Bangladesh both have the highest rate of fatalities due to tornadoes. Um, this is in large part not due to their strength, it's more so the strength of their buildings and their high population density because Bangladesh is one of the most crowded places to live in the world. And India as well, um, in terms of how small the country is and how many people are packed into yeah. it. And in contrast, here in the United States, in Tornado Alley, it's, <laughs> it's, that's much very farmland. And there's some cities out there, but nowhere near the den population density over there. So even a small uh, what we would call an F0 or F1 tornado, mm -hmm. can do some serious damage in, to lives and property over there. Right. I mean, we saw what happens when a storm goes through Tuscaloosa, like last year, um, and that was an EF5. So imagine something that strong going through Bangladesh. There would be upwards of hundreds of thousands of people dying um, should a tornado be that strong. Luckily for them, though, their, their tornadoes aren't typically as strong, but I mean, if you have the right ingredients for tornado development, you, you can get that oddball tornado that just happens to go through. And with there being so much more population density, chances are greater that it's going to hit a major population center. Also, uh, moving away from India, if we're talking about strong tornadoes, actually, South America has the strongest tornadoes outside of the US. And that's because the Rockies and Andes are essentially part of the same mountain range, um, with the exception of Panama and cutting through there. Um, but they do um, run north-south to the west flow. And Argentina, Paraguay, and southern Brazil all have major tornado areas. Um, granted, their season isn't as long, their tornado season isn't as long as ours, and typically it will be in fall as opposed to our spring because northern and southern hemisphere are uh, flip-flopped in terms of weather thanks to the sun. But they do have very strong tornadoes developing and there. And actually, Reed Timmer went down there and chased oh, really? once. Well, and I, and I can see that. We talk about not necessarily the position of the mountains. That's obviously an important key. But in the United States, we have the Gulf of Mexico providing that warm water. Mm -hmm. I can see a very similar shape of the water on South America. Is I kind of wish the globe behind us was around that point, but it can't always work out perfectly for us. Yeah. But I can see where that source of water can come in very similarly that it does in the Gulf of Mexico. And then as India comes around here, you can see the same thing where it's got that the source of water here where warm water comes on, hits mm -hmm. the air coming over the mountains. And I can see that same interaction happening in these different parts of the world. Yeah. And there isn't as much strength in terms of moisture, or well, not moisture, but the Gulf of Mexico is sitting very nice in terms of its relocation to the mountains. Argentina, it's a little bit farther away, it's a little bit more of a stretch, but you do have that kind of curve where, like you said, moisture could really easily enter in. Um, with the Arabian Peninsula just passing by right now, 
it also can um, fuel some thunderstorms as well. So it all depends on how everything works out, but you can get tornadoes anywhere. And actually, we're not just limited to Asia and South America or North America. Um, Europe and Australia, the two tiniest continents that we haven't talked too much about, also have significant tornado um, percentages as well. Um, typically wouldn't think of getting a tornado in England or France, but actually the UK has one of the highest um, tornado per area in Europe. Um, the Netherlands actually t takes the cake with that, number one. Um, but that's because both countries are relatively small. Um, Germany tends to be the main epicenter of tornado development. Um, the few, few uh, EF2, EF3 tornadoes, which are very, very strong, um, don't get me wrong. But thanks to the fact that they have better construction, better technology, um, there's significantly less deaths, and that's why it doesn't get as talked about. Um, also, other areas of Eastern Europe also yeah. can uh, It just goes them. to show that it doesn't necessarily matter where you are, is if you get the right ingredients for tornado genesis or severe storms, even for a brief period of time, you can get a tornado, and that can happen just about anywhere, and that's any severe event. So there's stuff all around the world that yeah. happens. And it's, it's just cool to think, um, we, I mean, we typically as meteorologists just look at what's going on up, up in the air. And you gotta focus on the geographic features as well, because those are just as important. And, and they affect how the air moves and goes up. So they, the, the geographic features have a direct impact on how air moves. And, that's why it's important to us as meteorologists. Yeah. So that does it for this edition of The Cold Front. But next week, we will be talking about how weather impacts sports. So we're, we're switch, switching gears a little bit. But that looks to be a very fun and uh, exciting episode to come. If you do have any ideas as to what we can do for the show, email us at valpovutv at gmail.com. And don't forget to like us on Facebook.